This is a CTV News special presentation. As a father, but also as a leader, I'm extremely worried. Let's be honest, things are challenging. Cost of living's going up, people are having trouble paying bills. We won't give in to those who fly racist flags. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act to address the blockades and occupations. Canada stands with Ukraine. There is no place for Russia as a constructive partner to anyone. China knows we'll stand up for human rights, we'll stand with people who are expressing themselves. There will be things we will disagree on. You will have to change it. That's fine. Let's create the conditions first. From Toronto's historic Kensington Market. A conversation with the Prime Minister. Here is Omar Sachedina. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Doing well. Doing great. well. Thanks. It's a great neighborhood. Ah, uh, listen, I, uh, I used, to, used to come here all the time and get uh, Chinese food or jerk chicken or just anything. It's one of, that, one of those pockets. And I think awesome. it really is a testament to Canada's uh, immigration history. You know, you have people from all over the world here. One of the great parts about this market is, is all the fruit stands. And when Canadians have gone grocery shopping this year, they're paying more for less, right? Everything is, is costing more. How concerned are you about the economic headwinds next year? Oh, extremely concerned. I mean, you can't talk to a Canadian family without hearing people worried about, uh, well, challenged with the situation they've been facing over the past months, uh, and uh, worried about what we know is gonna be a tough year next year. But that's why we also see the very best of Canadians as people step up for each other, as neighbours have been helping neighbours, as uh, our institutions have been stepping up, as, uh, as a government we've been uh, delivering more support to people. I mean, that's, that's what we do as Canadians in tough times and that's what we're going to continue to do. How much more support do you think you can offer Canadians next year because, you know, many economists are predicting that there will be a recession. The government has spent an unprecedented amount of money in terms of stimulus spending. Uh, what more can the federal government do without adding to inflationary pressures? Well, first of all, let's understand that Canada has the lowest deficit in the G7. We have one of the strongest fiscal balances of any of our peer countries. Uh, and that's partially because we were there to support Canadians who need it during uh, the difficult times of the pandemic. Investing in supports for families, for workers, for seniors, for youth, for small businesses is exactly what allowed our economy to bounce back so strong. And that's what we've continued to do, and that's what we're going to continue to do. But concretely, what does that mean? Does that mean that Canada is in a good position and your government is in a good position to be able to offer even more supports than it has uh, over, over the past couple of years? Will you be opening up the, um, the, the coffers? Or will it be more targeted spending? I, we've always focused on the targeting spending, even from the beginning. In, in it, Our very first thing was to bring in a Canada Child Benefit that stopped sending supports to millionaire families and delivered them instead to families that needed them. What we did this fall with 11 million households with the GST credit, uh, with uh, the uh, support for dental care for families that couldn't send their kids to the dentist, or even uh, with a housing top-up we're all we're very very targeted on the people who need it most uh, and that means we're not contributing to inflation while we're there to support people the price of just about everything has shot up you go to the grocery store you're paying more for things like lettuce and, and fruits carrying costs on homes have also shot up what is your government doing to protect canadians next year I think, first of all, understanding we're in a very difficult global context. The uh, war in Ukraine that's continuing, uh, the continued disruptions around global supply chains, the challenges that China's facing with its uh, you know, coming out of the zero COVID policy has put a lot of pressure on a lot of different parts of the world. And Canada's no different. We are a little bit better off than most countries around the world because, uh, because we have slightly more robust supply chains uh, around energy, around other things. But we're still dealing with global headwinds. And that's why 
even though we have a very, very strong financial position overall, uh, we're not hesitating to support people through this. Things that will help Canadians through at a very difficult time because we know this year was tough. Because of the global situation, the first half of next year is likely to be tough as well, but um, Canadians continue to be there for each other. But there's no government that can, that can keep spending at this level. And there may be a position now next year where Canadians need even more supports. Specifically, will that happen and, and how could it happen? Well, first of all, the, the Canadians are, are right to be you know, alert to whether the financial health of their country is good or not. Um, and of course, governments will say, yes, it's good. And opposition members will say, no, it's terrible. That's why it's useful to look at what the international bond rating agencies say about the fiscal plan and fiscal support of a country. Canada is the third largest AAA rating in the world. We have the best fiscal position of any of our G7 peers. Uh, most of our peer countries uh, lower deficit uh, than all of them. We're in a very good position, which allows us to both be there with generous, targeted supports where necessary, uh, but also uh, continue to remain fiscally responsible. And that's, that's the path we've walked over the past few years. A number of people said the kinds of COVID supports we put out were problematic uh, for our, our going into debt, and certainly we did take on a lot of debt. But what we also saw was we had a faster economic recovery and our fiscal position coming out of the pandemic is better than most other countries, even as we had a less bad pandemic because we were there for small businesses, for, for, for workers, for families. So what does that mean for next year then? Will, will there be that continued targeted spending on the heels of what has already been unprecedented spending? Well, what we spent this fall in targeted supports on GST, on rental and dental and, and other things, was calibrated to not contribute to the inflation crisis, which it, it didn't. That spending had a negligible, if any, impact on inflation. We're going to maintain our ability to do things and look at what we need to do. You, you've struck a deal with the NDP, a party that wants you to spend billions more on programs such as, such as farmer care. Uh, there, there are some economists who feel that particularly as we're facing these economic headwinds that austerity may be the, the way to go. What's your red line with the NDP? I mean, is there, is there a point where you say, no, this is too expensive, this is too much money, and are you willing to take a position on that red line, even if it means triggering an election? Well, first of all, you, you talk about austerity. And yes, it is unfortunate that a number of people, including the Conservative Party, still talk about austerity, that you can cut your way into better balance for people. They're talking about going after seniors' pensions. They're talking about uh, holding back on EI. Uh, these are things that we fundamentally disagree with. We know that supporting people in the right way matters. Now, there were a lot of concerns in our first budget after uh, signing that uh, confidence and supply agreement with the NDP that we were going to uh, put forward a, a, an NDP massive spending style budget. What our budget in 2022 actually put forward was an extremely responsible, balanced approach uh, that had everyone reaffirming our AAA credit ratings, that, that, that Canada was on solid financial backing. So what's your red line with the NDP? Um, At one point, do you what say what is good for Canadians or not? Uh, that's what we. That's our line with everyone. What makes sense? What doesn't make sense? Is there a for sense? Now? Is there something that they currently want that you will stop at? You'll just say no. We can't do this because it costs too much. Well, you can look at any of the things that they've put forward and see. Well, we did that one. We agree with them on that. Other ones we're not doing. Well, we won't do the things that we don't think are good for Canadians or good for our future. And what do you think that is? Well, give me a proposal what they're what they're talking about into pharmacare pharmacare we've we've been committed to reducing prescription drug prices for Canadians in real tangible ways we've moved forward with a half a billion dollar uh, rare drug rare uh, high cost drugs for rare diseases strategy that's taking a huge amount of pressure off some of the provincial issues uh, we're creating bulk purchasing power we're, we're creating uh, a Canada a drug agency to make sure that we're getting efficiencies and lower prices there's a lot of things we're doing as we keep moving towards lowering prescription drug prices for everyone. When we return... What are you going to lift all the restrictions? How do you respond to a gentleman like that? Sir, why don't you come on over? 
Come on, Edward. When a conversation with the Prime Minister continues. We now return to Toronto's Kensington Market for a conversation with the Prime Minister. As a father, but also as a leader, I'm extremely worried. This pandemic is dragging on and on, and it's exhausting for everyone. While most Canadians got their shots, a vocal minority disagreed. The whole point to this is, number one, to end the mandates for truckers. We need our truckers. Our truckers need to roll. And the protests rocked the country to its core. There is no place in our country for threats, violence, or hatred. It needs to stop. The federal government has invoked the Emergencies Act to address the blockades and occupations. You've had a difficult year. You, you faced a lot of uh, vitriol and, and hate as well, and I'm, I'm wondering how you've dealt with that this year particularly. Well, I think, first of all, the folks who had the tough time this year, particularly the early beginning of the year with the convoy, uh, were uh, the folks facing occupations in their neighborhoods, the folks seeing disruptions to supply chains that are already strained around the world, uh, and, uh, and being able to respond to it. Here, a selfie with Justin Trudeau still has appeal, Thank you, All thank right, you you're very welcome. You know, people facing facing significant disruptions that that were that were no fun for a lot of people. But the anti-vax vibe appears entrenched among some Canadians. Hey there, building better. Hey Justin, what are you going to lift all the restrictions? How, how do you respond to a gentleman like that who's who's um, says that there are restrictions still around? There's still a lot of anger. You know, what we have to do is try and engage with people as best you can. Uh, try and counter some of the uh, you want negative engage? narratives, you want the, the broken. Right uh, I, I suspect he won't really be listening to me, but I, I'm, I'm willing to try. Sir, why don't you come on over? Come on over. Sorry. So, what's your name? Do you have a first name? I do. What's your first name? My name's Attila. Hello, Attila. I'm Justin. Yes. So, what is your biggest concern right now? So, my biggest concern is all the restrictions that we have at the borders, uh -huh. the hassles that people have. I was detained coming back from Chicago. Okay. And I was when, made to when show was that? Uh, August. August, okay. So, okay. the restrictions were still in place at that point. Correct. Are they all okay. gone now? Uh, most of them are absolutely gone, yes. And they're going to be gone for good. But that depends on COVID, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? If, so, if the if situation comes back, we're going to have to be responding. Every step of the way, we've listened to doctors, we've listened to public health experts to do what we can to keep Canadians safe. So why are Canadians being uh, doctors, people like, um, let's say, uh, Stephen Malthouse, uh, people like uh, Robert uh, Malone, Okay. why are they being so uh, restricted and shunned I don't know those doctors you're talking to. What we, what we okay. focus on is public health experts, uh, uh, pandemic, uh, pandemic researchers, uh, the kinds of people who've actually gave us the recommendations that led Canada to having a far less damaging and deadly pandemic than many places around the world, even as we saw our economy come back stronger. Uh, every step of the way, we'll listen to science and doctors, and that's, that's what so we're going to get to it. So you're what happened in, in Ottawa with the truckers was a, a good thing? No, it wasn't. It was a very difficult time for citizens of Ottawa because it was also a difficult time for a lot of people who were worried about their futures across the country. I, I was there. Uh -huh. It was one of the most peaceful right. places I've Thank ever been so. Well, you know what? There's, there's an open investigation. There's a... There's a, there's a, a, a uh, level of transparency going on with the commission uh, that will put out a report on uh, out whether curious, you're right or me. Anyway, thank you, sir. Oh, uh, you know what? <laughs> Vaccin it starts on vaccinations. Uh, yeah, are you surprised that there's? Are you surprised that there's still that anger out there? No, uh, I think I think people Canadians have always. Uh, been been able to have and proud of having a, a range of diverse views and perspectives and are comfortable sharing them openly in this city and, and in this country. That's one of the great strengths of this country and that's what we're going to continue to uh, continue to make sure everyone can do. Hi. Hi there. How are you guys doing? You. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, nice to meet you. Pleasure to you had guys. said at some point during those protests that the protesters were part of a fringe who believed in conspiracy theories and wear tinfoil hats. When you go back and reflect on um, those, those words specifically, do you feel that there's a lesson in there for you? Do, do you feel that you did everything you could to lower the temperature? I think in, 
in all my communications, in all in in the frustration that Canadians were feeling, not just around that, but around the pandemic in general, there was a sense that Canadians really stepped up for each other. People went out and got vaccinated to a higher degree than just about any other country. And because of that, we actually had a better and safer pandemic than most people. Yes, we lost far too many people and it was heartbreaking, but we did better than most of the other countries that we can compare to. The fact that there were some people out there who were actively spreading harmful disinformation and misinformation, harmful lies that made people scared that the vaccine was more dangerous than the virus, and families sitting around the bedside of a loved one who was dying from COVID saying, oh my God, I wish he'd just taken the vaccine. I wish he hadn't listened to all those YouTube channels. Like, this is real. There were real tragedies, and there were people trying to to, to gin that up and to expand the divisions and the fear and sense of conspiracy that were out there. We had, as a government, always and will always be extremely patient with people who are hesitant uh, about getting a vaccine or whatever. But those people who were actively putting people's lives in danger by spreading falsehoods around science that will help and heal and, and, and save people and save our economy and save lives and save you know, our, our institutions. Those people, um, and they were a, a small minority within uh, the larger anti-movements who were really vocal, I don't and I won't apologize for calling out people who were harming their fellow Canadians. So Tin Foil Hat's comment, you don't regret. Well, when someone believes that your government is trying to inject a vaccine in you to control your mind and track you and there's a microchip in it, that's almost the definition of a government conspiracy theory that you wear a tinfoil hat to protect your brain from brain waves. When people fall into conspiracy theories, we need to call them out on that. We know that Justice Rouleau will be presenting um the findings from the Emergencies Act inquiry before the end of February. This was such a key moment for you, right? Any anytime there's a discussion about suspending civil liberties, it's a big deal. And I'm just curious, you Except know... Except the Emergencies Act didn't suspend civil liberties, right? The Emergencies Act was created after Canada brought in... The we now return to Toronto's Kensington Market for a conversation with the Prime Minister. Canadian healthcare may be sick, but for the provinces, the prescription is a dose of federal money. We all want to know that when we go to the hospital, we will receive the help we need. There's always a deal to be had, but we're all focused on delivering the best healthcare system for the people of Ontario and Canada. I think it's important that we keep on looking for a meeting between premiers and the prime minister. We are committed as a federal government to investing significantly more in our healthcare system. If we don't see action on healthcare, uh, we absolutely preserve the right to withdraw our support. This is very serious. We have seen a crisis in this country when it comes to hospitals. Children are being airlifted hundreds of kilometers away for treatment. Canadians are having to wait hours uh, for, for emergency care. And there is also a critical supply of, of medication. But the fact that we got to this level in the first place in this country has surprised a lot of people because this is, of course, a G7 country where people have expectations for a certain level of care. A lot of people are saying this is a life and death issue, mm -hmm. the crisis in, in hospitals, but it isn't being treated like one. Um, as we all learned during the pandemic, uh, there are very different responsibilities when it comes to what a federal government can do and what uh, a provincial government can do. Provincial governments are in charge of delivering health care. The federal government helps fund uh, the provincial uh, health care systems across the country to make sure that everyone gets uh, the same high quality free health care that they need. Right now we're seeing that our health care systems are strained if not broken right across the country in many many ways. But as the head of the Canadian Medical Association said this past summer, you can't fix something by just putting money into a broken system. We're going to be there to, to, to send billions more on top of the record amounts that we've sent to the provinces for health care. We're going to send more. But we need to see 
real improvements. We need to see results and outcomes. That means that you know, kids aren't waiting in hallways or being airlifted across the province, that seniors uh, aren't continuing to, to, to face uh, under, under quality care. We need to see transformations in our system. And yes, the last thing anyone wants to see is the federal government fighting with the provinces over, oh, it's your fault, it's your fault. Nobody wants to see that. They just want it fixed. What is the, what is the interim solution? I mean, you haven't even sat down to meet with the premiers, which is something they, they all want. What, will you be doing that in 2023? The solution that the federal government has is to send more money to the provinces. And that's not the result that Canadians want. The Canadians want more, uh, more and better care, better health care workers, better, uh, rapider, uh, more rapid uh, 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 recognition of credentials. These are things that Canadians need. And right now, by saying provinces need to come to the table willing to make a deal, willing to say yes, we're going to be accountable for any more money that comes into it to results for Canadians is the kind of thing that's going to solve this. And Because as I've talked to nurses and doctors and frontline workers in our healthcare system, they've all said, make sure the provinces are actually delivering better care in exchange for the money that the federal government continues to send them. And that's what we're going to do. I, I want to move on to your government's commitment to reconciliation. There are about 300,000 children in this country who are still waiting for First Nations child welfare. Your government's proposed um, gun ban, Bill C-21, which has evolved into something far more expensive, has drawn criticism from the Assembly of First Nations who say it would unfairly impact hunters who, who, who live off the land. Uh, how do you respond to those people who say that despite your government's commitment to reconciliation, it's missing the mark? Uh, we have moved forward in deeper and better partnerships with Indigenous peoples in a, a respect-based way in investing billions in ending uh, 137 long-term boil water advisories. There's about 30 left, but each of them have a plan and, and a project manager and the funding to, to lift them, so we're on the right track on that. On the, on the guns issue, it's, it's an important one, and we need to consult more and work with Indigenous communities on that to make sure they understand we're not going after any of their traditional rights to hunt, because obviously hunting is a huge part of life for many, many Canadians, not just Indigenous, and we fully respect that, and we're going to protect that. But when we brought in our ban on assault-style weapons two years ago, we knew that manufacturers would keep updating their lists and trying to get around the ban with new, new models. And we have to make sure that that ban continues into the future. Nobody wants assault-style weapons anywhere in this country. You don't use them for hunt, hunting. Uh, and you shouldn't have them for any other reason. So we created a definition and a list that goes with that definition of the kinds of characteristics that means uh, these are assault-style weapons that just won't be allowed in Canada anymore. Now, you can imagine that there are some weapons that are used for hunting that unfortunately fall on the wrong side of the line. Not many, but there are some that are slightly overpowered or have too large a magazine capacity, or technical reasons like that, including some of the guns that are often used by indigenous hunters. So our focus now is on saying, okay, there are some guns, yes, that we're gonna have to take away from people who were using them to hunt and say, but we're gonna also make sure that you're able to buy other guns from a long list of, of guns that are accept, that are fine for hunting and, and you know, whether it's rifles or shotguns. We're not going at the, the right to hunt in this country. We are going at some of the guns used to do it that are too dangerous in other contexts. On the issue of the compensation, I was speaking to an Indigenous uh, advocate who was saying we have had to litigate our way to success. Why, why are there still 300,000 um, children and families still waiting for, for compensation? Why is that such a battle still? Uh, we, uh, actually, it's, we agreed uh, with uh, the Indigenous organizations uh, to compensate to the tune of $20 billion uh, children who'd been, uh, peop uh, people who now were mistreated as children in care. So we've actually, we took it out of the courts. We took it into negotiations. We found a number that, that works for everyone, and we want to get that money out as quickly as we possibly can, and that's what we're doing. When we return. There has been so much international pressure against Vladimir Putin, but he remains entrenched. What do you think it'll take?
when a conversation with the Prime Minister continues. We now return to Toronto's Kensington Market for a conversation with the Prime Minister. The wail of air raid sirens in Ukraine and the horrors of war forced Canada to follow its NATO allies and take a united stand against Russia, accused of war crimes. Canada stands with Ukraine. Canada stands with its allies against this aggressive Russian positioning. When uh, we talk about war crimes, we cannot forget that the worst of crimes is war itself. Russia is not achieving its strategic objectives. Ukraine can win this war. Putin and his accomplices will fail. Ukraine will prevail. Slava Ukraini. In a couple of months, we'll be approaching the one-year anniversary of the war in uh, Ukraine, the Russian invasion on Ukraine, and Canadians continue to watch in horror what's unfolding there. Despite the unified stand that NATO has taken and Vladimir Putin's battlefield losses, the conflict continues. Why, why hasn't NATO been able to stop this war? What will it take? Well, first of all, NATO's not in this war. Uh, Ukraine is uh, a friend, but they're not a NATO country. Our support for Ukraine is based on, first of all, Canada's deep friendship and, and, and long-time historical ties with Ukraine. Our support for principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty and the UN Charter that Russia violated with its continued invasion of Ukraine. We will continue as friends and allies and supporters of Ukraine uh, to be there with weapons, with equipment, with support, with humanitarian aid, with financial support to keep the lights on in the government. We will continue to stand with Ukraine as long as it takes because y Ukrainians are not just fighting for their democracy and their right to choose their future and their territorial integrity. They're fighting for the principles that underpin all of our countries. There has been so much international pressure against Vladimir Putin, but he remains entrenched. What do you think it'll take? I think we're seeing uh, from, uh, from the Russian sides, from things that are trickling out despite all the misinformation and disinformation that, uh, that uh, Putin continues to feed Russian citizens, um, there is a fatigue around the war. There is real concern about the continued mobilization of people from the small villages across Russia. Uh, and there is uh, tiring. There is, uh, they are tiring of it. Ukraine stands strong in my conversations, including very recently with Vladimir Zelensky. Uh, he's pointed out there is a plan for peace. It, it is something we are all working for. But it will be not on Russian terms, it'll be on Ukrainian terms, because Russia made the terrible miscalculation of thinking they could invade a peaceful neighbor and get away with it. And it's not just important for Ukraine, it's important for the world that we stand up against it. And quite frankly, the way Canadians have responded and the unity around that, purchasing half a billion dollars of sovereignty bonds that we admitted uh, for Canadians to support Ukraine, but also the way we're stepping up around the world to, to support countries that are more vulnerable to Russia uh, and Russian influence uh, with food, with fuel, with other measures, is bringing the world together. And Canada's playing an important role on that. And Canada has, has opened its doors to Ukrainians. There are about 130,000 who have arrived in this country. Your government has set a target of 500,000 uh, permanent residents by 2025. The Ukrainians have come in under uh, a temporary resident uh, process, a uh, special process. If, if those Ukrainians who are here under that temporary process then choose to become permanent residents, what does that do to that 500,000 target? Is this an addition to that previously uh, determined target? Certainly, uh, some of them will choose to stay, but I know from talking with many of them, most of them are looking forward to going home and rejoining their husbands and fathers and, and communities and rebuilding Ukraine. Canada will absolutely be part of that. If people want to stay, we have, as you mentioned, increased our immigration targets significantly, so there will be room. Uh, so is that on top of the 500 if, if they stay? Uh, I don't know that we've exactly uh, determined that yet. We have the targets that we've put forward. Uh, we'll see how many, how many uh, 
Ukrainians choose to, to stay in Canada. Your government has also set a target of 40,000 Afghans in this country. And At so least 40,000, yes. 26,000 have arrived so far. There, there is a perception that, that Ukrainians are being welcomed into this country um, faster than Afghans are. And I say that with the caveat that they're, that they're separate streams. But why is it taking so long? I mean, your government has said that it's complicated, but we've spoken to many Afghans who say their biometrics are done, their applications are approved, but they still can't get to, to Canada. What, what, From where? What is their, they're in Islamabad. Okay. So, so why, why is that taking so long? Well, if, first of all, as you say, there are many uh, Afghans who fled to neighboring countries who uh, are looking to come onto Canada or other places. And Canada, as you pointed out, has stepped up to a greater degree than just about any other country in terms of welcoming uh, Afghans to Canada who are fleeing the Taliban. There's no question about that. Uh, we've done as much as any other country and we're going far beyond most countries, uh, even, on a per uh, even on an absolute basis, not just a per, per capita basis. Uh, we are also very concerned about getting people out of Afghanistan, though. That is a much more difficult situation because getting them out from under uh, a Taliban government that doesn't want to give them travel documents, that doesn't want to facilitate their departure uh, will require us to continue to work there but we're not going to give up on those Afghans who weren't able to escape Afghanistan uh, if uh, we do have a, a duty of care of a responsibility to and we have to many of them and and when that target of 500,000 is met there when, when that announcement was made by our government there were a lot of people still waiting for an announcement on housing a national housing strategy when people come into this country, they need some place to, to live and stay. Oh, first of all, we announced our national housing strategy back in 2017. But when you have 500,000 immigrants coming into this country, what more supports will be given to increase supply? Or can you even do that? Well, one of the limits on increasing supply right now is a shortage of workers uh, in construction, a shortage of workers in communities across the country, which can be solved uh, by immigration. So uh, it's something we have to do responsibly and make sure they're aligning. But, but we know that immigration grows the economy, it grows communities, uh, it creates opportunities, it creates jobs. I mean, this is one of the great blessings of, of serving Canada uh, as leader is that I don't have to spend my time justifying why immigration is good for Canada because Canadians know that unlike many of our fellow democracies where there are real uh, strong dynamics against immigration we have the benefit of saying yes we're going to manage it well uh, we're going to bring people in they're going to continue to build our cities as they always have uh, and build better futures for themselves their families and all of us along the way next canada is positioned to be a reliable clean responsible supplier to asia of raw materials of, of manufactured goods that is very exciting when a conversation with the prime minister continues we now return to toronto's kensington market for a conversation with the prime minister a globe-trotting prime minister hit the road to sell Canada as a trading partner across the Pacific. Adam Justin Trudeau. Standing up to a growing and belligerent superpower. We're going to continue to be here in the Indo-Pacific in a broad range of ways, including increased defense investments, more diplomatic engagement, more trade and investment relationships. China is an increasingly important global economic power. But it's also an increasingly challenging or disruptive global economic power. Obviously, everyone in China should be allowed to express themselves. There will be things we will disagree on. We're going to continue to ensure that China knows we'll stand up for human rights, we'll stand with people who are expressing themselves. There was a situation on the sidelines of the G20 summit where there was an interaction between you and the Chinese president, uh, which many people said sort of uh, exposed a rift that the two countries had. Uh, how, how did the relationship get to such a low point? Um, I don't know. Uh, obviously, there have been tensions over, uh, over the past many years. Uh, do we point to the Michaels uh, first as an hostage diplomacy or, or, or coercive diplomacy as, uh, as a, a part of the low point? Do we talk about uh, you know, the, many of the, uh, the, the 
allegations of interference in so many different uh, parts of our lives. The Chinese Canadian community is consistently uh, facing uh, tensions and stresses from, uh, from, uh, from the Chinese government. There are long and many reasons uh, why there is tension there. And, and as I always do and as I always will, I spoke directly and frankly with, uh, with the Chinese president to highlight uh, Canadian values, Canadian interests, and uh, and to demonstrate that we're we're looking to be constructive uh, in areas like fighting climate change and even in trade. But we need to see respect for the rules-based order, respect for international law, and and uh, respect for for Canadian values. I know your government uh, unveiled the Indo-Pacific Trade Strategy. Uh, does that mean you will be making a, a trip to, to China? and to India in the new year? Actually, the Indo-Pacific strategy is more than just a straight trade strategy. Yes, it has trade elements in it in terms of diversifying our trade throughout the region. Um, much of Canada's trade remains with China, but uh, the opportunities in Vietnam, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, and in India itself uh, are, are massive and significant, and we're going to make sure we're investing in those. But it also features security participation. It, it involves uh, investments in infrastructure. It involves uh, better diplomatic ties, better, deeper uh, political ties. These are the kinds of things throughout the region that will benefit Canadian jobs, Canadian growth. One of the exciting things uh, that I've talked about with a lot of leaders around the world, particularly in the Indo-Pacific, uh, is interest in Canadian uh, minerals that are produced uh, cleaner, and more responsibly than from other parts of the world. And there is an increasing desire by big companies and by consumers around the world to know where the ingredients in everything from their food to their cars are coming from. And Canada is positioned to be a reliable, clean, responsible supplier uh, to Asia of raw materials, of, of manufactured goods that is very exciting. And, and this is a moment that is going to be good for Canada, but good for the world to see more Canada connected with the world. When we return. It's happened with you. It's happened with Mr. Morneau. It's happened with Ms. Ng. Why does it keep happening? From my perspective, it sucks. When a conversation with the Prime Minister continues. We now return to Toronto for a conversation with the Prime Minister. Sunny ways, my friends, sunny ways. Lofty ideals, but these days dogged by controversy. We need to make sure that uh, the office of the Prime Minister is without reproach. The process we have in our country isn't that I report to journalists on my personal situation. It's that I report to the Ethics Commission. I should have recused myself. And I'm sincerely sorry for not having done so. The buck stops with the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, you've been in power now for, for seven years. Uh, you have violated uh, ethics rules, so have members of your cabinet, and most recently your international trade minister. Why do these ethical breaches keep happening, and why haven't you been able to stop them? Well, I think, first of all, um, Our government is focused on uh, getting things done for Canadians, on delivering uh, the kinds of results that Canadians elected us to do. Ambitious. And you can action. do that without breaching Change. ethics. When when you do lots of things. Uh, every now and then people are going to make mistakes. And that is why it's a good thing that we have a system uh, that catches those mistakes, that calls them out, that you know, shares them with Canadians, uh, that, that we explain and and Canadians get to decide whether it was an honest mistake or whether someone was trying to fill their pockets. I mean, we have a system that has the kind of accountability, transparency, transparency that works and that is clear to reassure Canadians that if someone is taking advantage of the system, either deliberately or by accident, they'll get caught and called out on it. And that's, that's an example of the institutions working. Now, from my perspective, it sucks um, because you, know, you don't want people to be making mistakes. You want people to be able to focus on delivering good things for Canadians. But it's happened but with it you. It's happened happen. with Mr. Morneau. It's happened with Ms. Ng. You've been in power for seven years. Mm -hmm. What's missing? Why does it keep happening? I think I think people are always uh, going to be trying to do the right things, but every now and then there will be mistakes. Uh, and you know, what what we will continue to do is you know improve our systems, uh, you know make sure people are being careful and learning from those mistakes. 
Being a prime minister is a tough job. Nobody would dispute that. There has been a lot of hate thrown your way this year. There, there have been people wearing t-shirts with Nooses, uh, absolutely horrid stuff. And I'm just wondering how you've dealt with that this year and how your family has dealt with that this year. You know, what, what worries me about that is not that it's aimed at, at me in particular. I don't take it personally. What I see is there's an awful lot of people who are hurting out there. A lot of people who are frustrated, who are angry, who are lashing out at whatever convenient target there is. At, I'm certainly uh, someone that people can blame for a lot of things uh, if they want, and, and that's what they do. What interests me more about this whole thing is what can we do to reassure those folks that their institutions are there for them, that when we're talking about fighting climate change, for example, we're talking about getting better jobs for them into the future. And you know, I was just in Hamilton and uh, making an announcement around the greening of a DeFasco's mill, moving away from coal-fired uh, steel making to uh, greener electric arc steel making. Um, and it was great news for the company, but it was really great news for the workers there. And these were you know, big guys and, 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 and you know, tough women who were focused on you know, work at really tough job. And they were saying like this, this green transformation means that you know, this woman said she was a third generation DeFasco steel worker in Hamilton there was now going to be a seventh and eighth generation because we're investing. We actually have a plan to make sure that not just Canada benefits from the way the world is changing, but Canadians benefit with good jobs, with opportunities, whether it's the electric supply chain uh, for zero emission vehicles, uh, the battery supply chain, whether it's uh, this transforming our mining industry towards more electric critical minerals. These are the kinds of things that are designed to reassure people that there is place for them in the future, that the future is uncertain, sure, but how we're working together, leaning on each other and solving these problems brings us together. So yes, some people are mad and lashing out. For me, every time I hear someone say that, I, my, my reflection is, okay, how can I reassure you that Canadians will continue to be there for you, that we're gonna build a better future? I'm not gonna tell you, yeah, Canada's broken because, it's, because you're facing a tough time. I'm gonna tell you, you know what, we can, improve this together. We can fix it together. Your government's going to be there. Your fellow Canadians are going to be there. There's reasons to be positive and optimistic about the country and about the future because that's who Canadians are. Prime Minister, happy holidays to you and to your family. Uh, and I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. And we leave you with the winter solstice celebrations here in Kensington Market. Happy holidays.